Well, when I was younger, my parents were very, very devout, and I was devout as a result of that. My parents taught me always to pray to Allah five times a day, at least, um, you know, the mandatory prayers, and then beyond that, whatever prayers I wanted to pray in my own free time, pray that as well. And prayer was a part of my life. It was essential. I'd wake up in the morning, I'd say my morning prayers, but that would be preceded with a prayer to be read as my eyes opened in the morning. And then as I went to the bathroom, there'd be prayers to be read when I washed my hands, prayers to read before reading the Quran, right after reading the Quran, which I read mostly every day. And then going to school in the morning after the morning prayers, and then coming back, reading the afternoon prayers. You know, Islam was ingrained in my being. And as such, my parents were very, very proud of me because I was the Muslim child that they were proud of raising. I came from a line of missionaries, and my, my family treated Islam, therefore, as an integral part of their lives, not something that ju they just did on the side. So Allah, uh, the Prophet of Islam, Muhammad, we were all uh, very much reverent and very much uh, worshipping Allah all the time. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't another religion so much as it was a way of life and it was something that we were, not just we followed. And so Islam was not something that I was apathetic towards or even indifferent towards. It was my very way and my very being. I was at a public speaking and debate tournament. It was my first year of college. I was 18 at the time. And a friend of mine who was on the team, his name is David. David and I were rooming together. And right before going to sleep that night, he pulled out a Bible. And I hadn't really seen anyone read the Bible on their own free time. I had heard it preached from, I had heard people refer to it, but never actually seen anyone read it on their own free time. And I said to him, David, you do know that that Bible has been changed, right? You do know that it's been tampered with. It's not the same Bible that was revealed to Christ hundreds of years ago. And unbeknownst to me, David was actually an up-and-coming apologist. He had studied the Bible, he had studied about the Bible, studied about the canon, reasons for believing the Bible reasons for believing in Christ as Lord. So he was ready for the question, far more ready than I had anticipated. He responded and said, you know, they really haven't been changed. We can test how much they have been changed. There's a science called textual criticism, which allows us to estimate approximately how much of a manuscript is variant from its original. And I looked into that and I began to realize, well, hey, the Bible hasn't actually been changed all that much. I began to realize, in fact, that no doctrine seems to have ever been changed, that from the beginning, the Bible stated that Christ is Lord, that He died for our sins, rose from the dead on the third day, and it never said anything else. So it wasn't until a few years later that I began to realize that maybe I was wrong. It took quite a few years of debating this and researching it and studying it for me to realize this. We have hundreds, or not hundreds of thousands, but tens of thousands of documents that show that the Bible is still close to the word that it was, that Christ did claim to be God. There's evidence for this, and for Islam, there's not too much evidence. It took me about three and a half years to come to that point, to realize that, hey, this stuff is true, that everything that I had been taught, I loved Allah, I loved Islam, I loved Muhammad, I loved my parents, I loved everything that I'd ever grown up with, but that didn't make it true. And I'm asking God, God, I can't find the truth by myself. You please show me the truth. Whatever I have to do, however much it hurts, whoever in my family will leave me, or whoever of my friends will leave me, whatever it takes, I will walk that path. I look back at that, I had no idea what I was asking for. I was at the foot of a hotel bed, and I had prayed, I had prayed and prayed to God, but this time I had prayed with the most humility that I had ever had. I broke down, I said, God, I don't know, I can't know, my eternal life is on the line. I ask you to tell me what the truth is. Provide me a vision, provide me a dream, anything. And that night when I had prayed it, my father was in the bed next to me and I was in my own bed. This was in a hotel room. He was already asleep. There was a little bit of light in the room, but as soon as I prayed that, everything went dark. And there was no more light in the room. And there before my eyes was hundreds, maybe even thousands of crosses. I was looking at them and I was wide-eyed and just as soon as they had come they had gone and I knew what had just happened I had received a vision but I didn't want to believe it so I looked up to God and I said God that doesn't count <laughs> I said that can't count that could be my eyes playing tricks on me subconsciously I might want to believe in Christianity you know seeing a whole bunch of crosses that's not necessarily the truth you didn't come down and tell me anything that could you know that's probably a vision but maybe not 
So I said to God, you know what, God, forget I asked for a vision. How about you provide me a dream? Any dream, and if it confirms what I just saw in my vision, then I'll become a Christian. And that night, I had a dream. It didn't take weeks, it didn't take months, it didn't take more than a few hours, if that. He gave me a dream that night. It was me standing at the threshold of a, a door, a narrow door. Not in the door yet, just outside it. My toes are, are at the line of the door. It's a narrow door, so it's about three feet wide, just wide enough to fit me. And probably about six to seven feet tall, just tall enough to fit me, and about the same depth in length. Just, uh, so it's a doorway, not just a door. At the other end of a door is David, my friend, sitting at a table, and it's a round table. And within that room are hundreds of people, all sitting at tables, and there's food laid out before them, and they're all getting ready to eat, but they haven't started eating yet. They're waiting, as if for a speaker, to come and start whatever it is, uh, a speech, a session, to shut the door and start speaking. But they haven't started eating yet. And I look at David, and I said to him, I thought we were going to eat together. And without turning back, he says to me, you never responded. That's all the dream was. Me at a narrow door saying, I thought we were going to eat together. And him at a feast saying, you never responded. I woke up and I immediately knew what that dream meant. That room was heaven. That room was the kingdom of God. And I was standing right outside the door. I was not in yet, because I had not responded. God gave me a dream that was so clear that I did not have to interpret it. But he was even more clearer than I had anticipated. A few hours later, I called David and I said, David, I had this dream. And he said to me, I don't even have to give you my opinion on it. That's right out of the Bible. And I said, what? And he said, go to Luke 13. And I went to Luke 13, verses 20 through 29, and you read it. And it's the people asking Christ. He said, will many people enter the kingdom of heaven? And he says, many will try to enter, but few will be able make every attempt to enter through the narrow door and people will be standing at that door knocking and that's exactly what happened in my dream I was at that door the door had not been closed yet but the opportunity to come in to that feast was still there I just had to respond at that point I kind of knew what I had to do I realized that Islam probably was not the truth that God was really pulling me even though I didn't want to be pulled I was kicking and screaming he was pulling me towards the truth. I was at a point where I hurt tremendously. I was mourning. I literally was mourning. I was crying on my way to school um, one day. And I said, God, please give me a few days to mourn. I just need, I need to mourn. Um, you know, I have people that I'm losing, people who might die when they hear this. Uh, let me mourn. And, you know, I'd go back to my apartment and I looked through the Quran and there was nothing to help me and I'd, I'd open up Matthew and I wouldn't even get through Matthew 5 and there God says, Blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. And I'm, I'm reading Job and all the, all the anguish that's, that I have, God understands, God, God's alleviating through the Bible, through His Word, not through the Quran. There's nothing in the Quran that was helping me. The Quran was giving me glimpses into a past life but nothing that was helping me, nothing at all. And every time I would open the Bible, it would be there. I would pray to something for God, and I'd say, well, how do I know I'm going to get this? And then I'd, op I'd open up 1 John 5, verses 14 through 15, and it says, everything we ask for, He will give us because He hears us. Because we believe in, in our hearts that Christ is Lord. And I did believe in my heart that Christ was Lord, but I didn't confess it. And even there, within that book, 1 John, He says, how do we know if our hearts condemn us? And He says, if we confess with our hearts and our tongues that Christ is Lord, then our hearts will not condemn us. I hadn't done that yet. I hadn't confessed yet. I didn't know yet. Romans 10 says the same thing. It says, you know, if you believe with your heart that Christ is Lord and that He was raised on the third day from the dead, then you will be saved. And I hadn't done that yet. And then it hit me when I was reading Matthew. And it said, no one who denies me before men will I accept in the kingdom of heaven. So everyone who denies me, I will deny before my Father. And everyone who proclaims me before the men in this world, I will proclaim before my Father in heaven. And it was at that point that I couldn't deny Christ any longer. I couldn't deny God any longer. I couldn't hold my life, my values that I had chosen to believe, that I had no reason to believe except that I had always been born with them and lived with them. I began to realize that that was not the truth and I had to accept Christ into my life. I asked the Holy Spirit to change me. And after praying that prayer, the whole world looked different. 
I looked out at the world. I kid you not. I was at, when I prayed that. I was shocked, as if electrified. I had said words that to me were just words, but it was a request to God that He fulfilled. And at that moment, when the Holy Spirit filled me, I was stuck in that position for ten minutes, as if I had been electrocuted. I was stuck. I was like this for ten minutes, not able to move. And when I finally moved. I looked at the world around me, and it was absolutely beautiful. There was so much hope. There was so much meaning. Because at this point, I realized what life was all about. It's not about living your life as a good person. Sure, you need to do that, but that's not what it's about. The primary purpose of life is to praise and worship the one true God who came to this world and died for our sins, so that we could appreciate Him, so that we could worship Him fully with joy and rejoicing, as Paul says in Philippians 4. Rejoice always, because the Lord is near. My life had meaning now, because now I could go. Out and preach the word. I didn't have to just sit back and say, "Hey, everyone who does good deeds will get to heaven." No, now there was meaning. Now there was people need to know who God is, what He has done. People need to know what our position is in relation to Him. They need to know that we have to worship the one true God and His Son, Jesus Christ, who came to die for our sins. We have to tell people that yes, God is one. However, He's one and three, and three and one. Whether we can understand that or not is beyond our scope. We don't have to understand it. All we have to do is understand that Christ is is God. That God decided to come down as a person. Muslims have an innate tendency to see that as impossible. There is no reason why that's not possible. God can choose to come to this world as a person. Show me anywhere in Quranic scripture and Ahadith where it says God cannot. To the contrary, you'll find everywhere in Islamic scripture that God can do whatever He wants. On the last day, Yom Al Qiyamah, as it is said in the Quran, where we will all be judged. No man can find their way into heaven, even Muslims, on their own merit. It has to be by God's grace. Even the Prophet of Islam said to pray for his forgiveness many times a day, because he doesn't know if he's going to enter into heaven or not. Only by God's grace will he enter into heaven. That grace. That even Muslims are relying on on that last day to enter into heaven is the same grace that Christians are relying on. The only difference is that Christians believe that grace has already been given on that cross 2,000 years ago. He provided that grace for us. The same grace, not a different one. We just have to find it in our hearts to search for that in a true, open manner, and we will find out. I have full faith that everybody who asks God in an open heart. To show them the truth, will be shown the truth.